Back at Horse Racing Nation headquarters, downtown Louisville, Ed DeRosa with Sarah Albadwi. Take two on the Preakness. Huge defection, Sarah, Kentucky Derby winner. Rich Strike will not be in Baltimore. No crab cakes. No Maryland, my Maryland. They're going to skip it. They're going to point to the Belmont. Still an interesting race, though. I wanted to zero in. I think we're down to sort of a big three at this point. Epicenter, runner-up in the Derby. Early voting, runner up in the wood. Oaks winner, Secret Oath. One's a front runner. One can be near the pace, sit off. The other has a big, bold move, typically in her races. How do you see it all shaking out? Well, I think that early voting is likely going to get the run of the race in here. I know that this spot was really handpicked for him by Chad Brown. They opted out of the Derby. They put him here instead, where he is much more likely to be successful and I just don't know if I see any other real pace going with him early as far as how the field is shaping up as of right now. We did already talk about this race a little bit, but obviously that was before Rich Strike opted out. Obviously not going to be enjoying any of the Maryland fanfare <laughs> like you mentioned. I, not that it would matter too much to him, but... What do you think of that decision? Do you think that it's mostly in the benefit of the horse? Do you think that there's a little bit of he might not have had as much of an opportunity to succeed in the Preakness without a pace set up like he got in the Derby, which realistically, when is he going to see that again? Uh, I'm not sure if they don't think they have a shot matters because they ran in the Derby. Mm -hmm. And even if they were confident that their horse was going to fire – his best shot. They couldn't have realistically thought they were any better than 20 to one in the Derby. I, I just wouldn't believe them if they said, Oh, we really thought we were one of the ones. Uh, so to me, that sort of mitigates any thought of, well, they don't want to run the horse if he's not a true contender. I think he is depending on what speed rating service you use the Preakness, the Derby winner often comes back and runs as well in the Preakness. So if he were to repeat that buyer, He's right there with the rest. So I wouldn't have begrudged them for going for that matter. I'm sure that Eric just didn't like what he saw training Wednesday. I mean, it's sort of Occam's razor to me or Thursday, whenever that was that he pulled the plug. Uh, simplest explanation. That's it. You trust your trainer. That's why they're in the position they're in. And I would say I'm more dubious about him running in the Belmont, skipping the Preakness than I am, you know, some other, you know, conspiracy reason why he's not running in Baltimore. I'm more concerned that, okay, when are we actually going to see him again? But if he's not right, I mean, I think the world agrees. You don't run a horse who isn't able to run his best. Absolutely. And I know a lot of us fans are probably feeling a little bit of disappointment that we won't hmm. see a horse go for that triple crown. Like we see, I know there's been a lot of conversation Well, the spacing needs to be different that conversation has already been had in the past when horses weren't able to complete the feat of the triple crown. We were waiting 37 years to see that done by American Pharaoh. I don't know that that's necessarily something that we're ever going to see happen. The spacing of the race is being changed because that's why it is so difficult to do well in the triple crown because they are different distances, different tracks. You have new shooters coming in at each stage of the triple crown as well. So I think that that's kind of the fun of it all. And that's why you need a real champion to be successful in winning all three. Yeah, no, I mean, it's the triple crown. It's elevated even above winning any individual classic race. Part of it is the endurance, the sound soundness to compete in all three. And this horse isn't up to that task and that's fine. He's a derby winner and, you know, I never take that away from him. For me, way more important from why this matters to me than no triple crown is it changes the complexion of how the race is going to be bet. He would have been six to one, maybe eight to one. Don't think he would have been favored. Certainly think the other three we've already mentioned would have taken more money, but with him out, that does redistribute that money. And I'm guessing it's going to go more toward the favorites than the long shots in this case. So if you liked Epicenter, if you liked early voting, if you like Secret Oath, you're getting a lower price now. And you're really not changing the complexion of the race at all because he's a stone cold closer. So there's no effect on those three. So I'm a little disappointed knowing I was going into the race with maybe there's something to do with him in there and not a horse I wanted to bet.
That's fair enough. And I think those big three now going into this race are certainly going to take a lot of play. Do you see Epicenter being favored? I know we're going to look at your fair odds as well, but would you agree that he is the likeliest favorite? Yeah. And uh, I didn't put a morning line with it. And uh, Pimlico does a great job with its morning line. So I'm eager to see what they come up with when we draw on Monday. And I'm sure we'll discuss uh, either shortly thereafter or on the Ron Flatter hardcore pod for the Preakness uh, from Old Hilltop. Looking forward to recording that on Tuesday, but I think my fair odds are going to be pretty close to the morning line. So I'm like, okay, where is the chance to bet this race? Maybe it's that the other horse in the wood, what is it? Skippy Longstocking. Mm -hmm. He got a pretty decent rag as a number chasing home early voting with Mo Donegal blowing by him. So maybe he's one you can kind of be your key underneath and you beat one of the big three in the try and you still do. Okay. You know, Kenny's horse, horses, depending on what he decides to do, maybe. But, you know, this this feels to me like the Oaks all over again, where there were the four and two of those four were in the exact. Uh, I have to think two of these three are going to be prominent. I would agree with that. And I think we're all kind of looking for that price to spice up underneath. But I, I feel like we were doing that in the Derby and then we got the 80 to one on top. So I'm interested to see how the, the draw goes and where everybody ends up positioned. If there is any other speed to go with early voting, I wonder with simplification because he is so tactical and we have seen different running styles from him He's one of the first ones that confirmed to go to the Preakness. We saw him take back in the Derby and make a closing run, and that was the best decision for him in that race. I wonder if he sits closer now in the Preakness and kind of stalks or tries to go after early voting a little bit early on. But it's hard to decide how the pace is going to shape up because I think if you go with early voting, you take away your horse's chance. And if you don't go with him, you take away everybody's chance. So I think it'll be a, a very interesting rider's race in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Especially uh, in the sense of how Secret Oath runs her races, that big, bold move. Uh, as we saw in the Louisiana Derby and in the Kentucky Derby epicenter, certainly capable of sitting off. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't like a, a slingshot type move, which is what I've come to expect from Secret Oath based on our last two, especially the Arkansas Derby and the Kentucky Oak. So if you're epicenter, yeah, do you take it to early voting early and maybe attempt to slam the door on Secret Oath, put some distance between you and her and she can't catch up? Or do you let her do the dirty work knowing she's going to come with that run either on the backside or the far turn and then hope to follow her, have her rough up early voting a little bit and then go on with it? think either one could be in play. Uh, like you said, that's part of the fascination of the race. Still a good one, despite the defection of Rich Strike. But I, I mean, I, it's a touchy subject and everyone has to have an opinion and a take. I don't think it's untoward to say the Preakness without the Derby winner is not as exciting. And that's fair to say. Which I mean, you're a fan. It can be exciting still. Of course. But it loses something. I would agree with that completely. And I think as fans, you have a right to say, oh, well, this is a little bit less interesting now that there's no triple crown on the line. And you can still also respect and understand that they're doing what they believe is best for the horse. Right. You, you can feel both and that's OK. <laughs> so any all the other, feels, all the feels. Any other uh, Preakness thoughts? I wore my Preakness shirt. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> and plenty of time to launder it for next week. Uh, <laughs> hopefully launder some money as well. Uh, better. <laughs> Preakness results I'm hoping for than Derby. I'd say we'll talk about this next week with all the pick fives and whatnot going on, Black Eyed Susan and Preakness days. But I struggle in Maryland. Uh, you know, I just can't help but play the Preakness. I've kind of weaned myself off the Friday card. Um, it, it's tough out there. It's not a circuit I'm familiar with. But I do think with these kind of size pools, you have to at least take a look. So I'm going to try to be judicious as a better and not just, you know, be going all in because oh it's the big day but i do think this preakness once i narrow it down on okay i really think it sets up and maybe it's not for the big three it's you know okay which one's keys in the try you have to play the race that all three don't hit so i, I think that's where the opportunity is nice and i'm hoping that un ojo provides me with some opportunity <laughs> after scratching out of the derby i mean he could have he could have yeah, done well I mean, there after with what, how the pace was. After what happened, I mean, it's hard to anymore say, well, this horse can't win. I mean, my very minimal, like, oh, what can I possibly say that, you know, say I saw this derby in any sort of light would be 
I did not have Rich Strike as the least likely winner. I think to me that was classic Causeway. The least likely yes. it was Summer is Tomorrow for me, yeah. which similar to which classic Causeway ended up being on the front end. But um, yeah, n neither had much of a chance, but both took more money than right. the winner. So right. uh, just, you know, something to keep in mind. I, I think a lot of times we get hung up on who can or can't win, myself included. Rich Strike was definitely in the can't win pile, can't use them all. But in retrospect, there was value there because he was the longest shot. I thought he was more likely than four or five others. And I didn't want to bet Taba or Crown Pride. Not saying that Rich Strike was more likely than Taba in my mind, but from a wagering standpoint, I didn't want to use them at all either. So in the Preakness, I, I need to keep that in mind. Like, okay, who... If Uno hoes the longest shot, does he deserve to be? Well, my fair odds, yes. So maybe it's a bad example. But if some other horse is the longest shot, then maybe that's an upgrade underneath. That's fair enough. And I think hindsight is always 2020 in it these is. circumstances. We can always <clears throat> learn from what we did wrong or what we could have done better in any sort of race or wagering, especially a big event such as the Kentucky Derby, where we do spend so much time discussing it and really analyzing each and every horse, how every aspect is going to play out. And now we can look back and say, anything can happen. <laughs> so. Anything can and uh, probably will next week in some way or another. Here's what's going to happen. People are going to like. And subscribe. And subscribe. And then we'll be back maybe Monday. I'm toying with like a live stream during the post draw. Wow. Just to have some fun with it. There we go. Yeah. See, all of this is always new to me. I never know what's going to well, happen. I'm just thinking about it. And, <laughs> and, you know, we'll see how Monday goes. But Tuesday for sure, the hardcore pod. And then yes. we'll probably target some pick and wagers uh, throughout the week at Pimlico. I guarantee it. All, all right. right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Make sure you do like and subscribe and check out our channel for all kinds of other content.